Union Smack is back officially. First episode of 2019, for the most part. Matt, what's going on? The man himself, fresh back from your trip, literally today. Blackpool, all that good stuff. We'll get there. What's going on, man? Welcome back. We know how you've been. We watched it, the video, all that stuff, right here on the channel, Chief Plug. Where can everyone catch you? All that good stuff. <laughs> you can catch me, as usual, on Twitter, at The Perfect Tenant. You can buy my book, The Undertaker, A Trip Down Death Valley, from CompletelyNovel.com, Amazon, Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, and our online shop, UnionSmack.BigCartel.com, where you can also purchase our t-shirts. And thanks to Rocky, another t-shirt to come in the next month or two, with a kick-ass design. I think you'll agree, Travis. Little trick up our sleeve. Got some new designs coming fresh for the new year, so definitely check us out there. And as always, on Twitter at the Hibiki TMD, hit that subscribe right down below for the best retro gaming and pro wrestling goodness. But my oh my, what a show we have in store. Matt, your journey to take over is coming on. We'll get there, but there's been quite a bit of news in the in wrestling world. Uh, the AEW press conference has gone down uh, since we've last recorded, all that stuff. Everybody knows now and how that went. Jericho, Neville, all those guys. Excuse me, Pac. I don't want to be pretentious. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, tons of stuff, but tons of rumors. Speaking of, I guess I guess the freshest rumor concerning AEW, Matt, to keep this more current, you know. Uh, the Revival, yeah. apparently, and Mike Kanellis and Maria Kanellis have, have apparently asked for their releases from WWE. Yeah, and honestly, Revival, I don't blame them because they've been treated shoddily since being called up from NXT. But Mike Kanellis, it's like, really? Does he really have any value with AEW? You know, it's, it's like, he came from, I think, Impact, didn't he, to WWE. Mm. They basically shit the bed with him by not putting him in NXT for two years and letting him, you know, develop his art. Like, you know, Balor did and, and the rest did. Shoved him on SmackDown Live. No one cared. You know, uh, and I know he's been out with his, you know, his demons. He's overcome drugs and whatever else, and he's got himself in phenomenal shape. But it's still, it's Mike Kanellis. <clears throat> you know, I don't care about him. I'm pretty sure AEW aren't aren't calling him every ten minutes asking when his contract's up. So I think if 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 Mike Kanellis has has indeed asked for his contract release, and I mean it's it's not been confirmed yet. But surely he'd be more value to Ring of Honor or somewhere like that rather than AEW right Go now. Go back to Impact. Impact has a yeah. buzz again, at least. Exactly. It's like he means nothing to professional wrestling, Mike Kanellis. You know? So, fuck you. I, I don't care about him right now. What they, they moved him to 205 Live and I've not seen him. I'll say this. So, for, for, for both situations in care? this... The revival and Mike <clears throat> Kanellis. I'm on different sides of the of the fence for both. If for Mike Kanellis, yeah. if someone can fact check this in the comments uh, down below, all that stuff, or if you know off the top of your head, Matt, did WWE pay for Mike Kanellis's rehab? I believe they did. Yes. If they did, what a dick! What a shitty thing to do. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, maybe it's because I have <laughs> fucking morals, or you know, I believe what right and wrong are. But that's kind of a shitty thing to do to WWE, especially if they pay for you to get help. Because rehab ain't cheap. I didn't know if you knew that. I don't know that. No, I don't. I don't know how much it is in um, in America. I know it's like on National Health Theater, but I know you have to pay through the nose over there. I don't give a shit. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, I, I'm a little under the weather trying to get there. I, I don't give a shit if they were tagging you with Kurt Hawkins out there against the Ascension every week or you're in the main event of WrestleMania. That shouldn't matter if they went out of their way to do that. They obviously saw some investment to do that in the first place, you could say. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but then I'll bring it back to the thing. It's like... We, we can get angry about it all we want, Travis, but in the end, it's Mike Kanellis. But on you the know, other side. Like, we, we're not going to be talking about him for the next yeah. month. Exactly. I, I, hopefully, I don't plan to talk about Mike Kanellis on the show again. It was just in the news. But <laughs> on the other side of that, not to get angry, I'm totally 100% behind the revival. 
Man, these guys were money yes. in NXT. And they really were. And I know the Marks like the Revival and people say blah, blah, blah. No, they really were a great fucking tag team. Really were like watching a modern Brain Busters. They knew their shit. You could tell they did their homework. They were fans like you and me. They know the business. They love the business. And I don't know. Well, we were saying all fair before the show went on. I don't, we don't know how they were. It'll come out in a shoot interview later. I'm sure one day, if these guys are pricks backstage since they got called up, they're cocky, arrogant, they rub people the wrong way. It's never come out. We don't know. But... If they if they weren't if they were company guys, what the fuck WWE? What Jesus Christ? What? Why? Even if you're not going to put the belts on them, Lucha House Party, Matt. Oh no! It's like weeks and weeks and weeks in a row. <clears throat> it's insulting. It's insulting to their skill, to you know, the, the love they have for the business, and I don't blame them one bit. It, they. WWE even tried to copyright the hashtag FTR logo. It's like how that passed, you know, management to get on telly in the first place since it came from being the elite is, you know, and what, and what the various things it could stand for. It, that's baffling. But why they want to fucking copyright that just to... It baffles me, Travis, what WWE are doing right now and what they're thinking. And honestly, I know they don't want the revival to go to AEW because then it'll be look what we let go, you know, look look what we squandered. But as it stands right now, it's like it, it, if if they've got to the point where they they've asked for their release, they've obviously got no interest in staying. They're either gonna yeah. walk out or you give them their release. Either way, you you've lost them. And <laughs> it's WWE's own fault. This is their own doing. They can't blame anyone. Other than themselves. i devil's advocate for a second. WWE right now is, is just so oversaturated, stocked up with talent. Do they even care, though, if the revival goes? You could see it from that point of view, I guess, maybe. I, I think um, they, they didn't care about the revival until this happened. But I, I think I, Vince has got to be smart enough to know that if they leave, they're going to you know, what's turning out to be credible opposition. So I, I think that part of Vince is going to want to keep them just so, you know, people don't go, what a fucking moron you are, what you've lost. Right. But I, I don't think he's got any real intentions of using them if he keeps them. It's just going to be like, I've got them, so you can't have them type of thing. Yeah, and call me crazy because I'm not. Vincent Mann is totally that guy that comes off like he hates to have egg on his face. We've seen him blow up in interviews with Bob yeah. Costas in the past. He hates being embarrassed. <laughs> we we shall see what happens to all parties involved in this situation. Um, other things going on. Speaking of, you know, this is not my quote, but people losing their fucking minds again with WWE's quote global domination and taking over everything. The uh, the UK Performance Center Matt was announced recently. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, recently found out it's down in London, so, so widely accessible. I, I watched the the press conference that Triple H did. I say Triple H, it was more Radzi, which really annoyed me. That was like that was my coach journey up to Blackpool. That was like the first ten minutes. I sat down, watched that. Radzi came on, and I nearly turned it off. But thankfully, did and did you watch the press conference? I watched uh, bits and pieces. I didn't catch the whole thing. Radzi stood in the ring and he went, as a, as a lifelong fan of professional wrestling, and I, I thought, I'm going to have to stop him there. It's like, lifelong fan. For a lifelong fan, he, he knows remarkably little about the business. So I don't believe him on that front. He made himself look an even more fucking dick than he, he usually does. But, yeah, Triple H comes out and he, he, he basically says this is like the first step in... What, what globalization? I think he said something like that. It was a week ago. I didn't write it down. Along but, the lines, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, it's good for, for UK talent that they sign. And for people who say like, it's like it's going to kill the UK Indies, it's not. You know, this isn't a, you know, a training camp or performance centre open to just anyone. You have to be signed by WWE to go there. So... You know, they're not killing the Indies. Sorry, they're not. They're there's there's plenty more fucking people coming up, you know, yeah. through the the same path that Pete Dunn and Tyler Bay did. So let's just can that now. It's 
it's they're just doing what every promoter's done for the most part in the history of pro wrestling. They're yeah. They they want to make money. They what can you say? Uh, people that are gonna gloss and gloat over the Attitude Era, you know, and, and people that love WCW and Eric Bischoff did the same thing with Mexico, and then you know, the, the, of course, the Hulkamania era, Vince and all the territories. This isn't anything new. This isn't. This shouldn't be shocking to anyone that WWE would try to. It's not. They're gonna take every single guy, and it's not like more more wrestlers aren't going to come out of wrestling school and stuff. People are they're still training as we speak, probably to some country to be a pro wrestler. There's always gonna be talent. It just always comes down to those guys with the X factors are few and far between, but every generation, there's always at least a handful. That's always going to happen till the end of time, because that's human goddamn evolution, for one. There's always going to be an indie scene, people. It is mm-hmm. what it is. Mm-hmm. Even, yeah. even the doldrums of it, professional it, it, wrestling, which I like to call 1992 to, through 1995, the doldrums, the low point of wrestling, there was still an indie scene. It was called yeah. ECW. Yeah. Not... Sorry. There you go. And it's not going it's, to... It's all right. It's not going <laughs> to fade away. It's not going to die just because, you know, Pete Dunne's been taken away from the Indies. It's like a lot of the other non-full-time w, uh, NXT UK talent are still allowed to, you know, go out there and perform for whoever they deem fit. So... I think people have blown it out of proportion. You know, it, it's haters going to hate in the end, don't they? So it's a training camp like a baseball team would have. Calm down, guys. That's it. That's it. It's, and it's somewhere for you know those who have signed with NXT UK to learn learn their craft more than the Indies could possibly offer them. You know, there's nutritionists and gyms that they don't have to pay for and I'm <clears throat> sorry like promo classes and I'm pretty sure places like ICW and Progress don't have that level of pro, pro, investment I, I can only so, imagine so. Progress having a performance center what it would be <laughs> there would just be pounds of Little. weed at the door and fucking strippers and yeah back room in a nightclub let's be honest that, that, that'd be progress this piece of... rev pro they just try to pay you in food and a nutritionist it's just like some pretty girl telling you you shouldn't eat as much fried foods i don't know what the hell we're talking about right now but i think guys calm down it's always a good thing to have some place for people to hone their craft uh my opinion yeah, exactly yeah. exactly and it's like these people can use the pc and you know it it, it, it's not settled that they're going to be with NXT UK forever, so they can take what they've learned there, <clears throat> you know, the conditioning, the tra- training, etc. And if they don't make it with NXT UK, they can take it back out onto the Indies and make themselves a bigger star than they were when they left it. So it, it's a plus all round. I'm literally going to pull this one out of my hat just to fill the rest of our news segment. I, this is pretty newsworthy. It's worth talking about. I think it's another thing people are overreacting, and I think it's going to benefit in the long run like it's done for other guys, Matt. Andrade C and Almas is just Andrade now. Let's finish off the news with that. I think it's fine because, honestly, I like C- the C and Almas, but I think, realistically, I think that's just going to confuse casuals. Because, for one, if you've never seen that name before as a casual it's hard to pronounce, I guess, and just confuse. You never want to confuse the consumer. And it works for guys like Cesaro and Rusev. I much prefer Rusev over Alexander Rusev looking back. I mean, I, I agree with that. It's like Rusev is a better name, but I, I don't like that they changed <clears throat> Andra, Andrade's name. It's just, it was fine. It was, yeah, if, if it's not broke, don't fix it. It's just leave some stuff alone, you know? If it worked before, it'll work again. It's like, I feel like when they do this with some, not all talent, just some talent, it's like, I feel like they're insulting my intelligence. You know, it's like they're automatically assuming that, oh, the SmackDown Live fans don't watch yeah. NXT. I don't well, know. yeah, they do. Maybe, maybe. But on the other hand, I think it works perfectly for Elias because Elias just... It, it makes the character have that bold sentiment to it, I guess. It comes off much more stronger than a lot yeah. Samson. Or, I mean, they took the Lynx and all Figgy. I'm kind of either way on that. But Cesaro, I guess, is a perfect. I much prefer just Cesaro. Now. At first, I was like, eh, man, I wish they would just call him Antonio Cesaro. I mean, just call him Claudio Castagnoli, in my opinion. But, you know. But Cesaro <laughs> has grown on me so much. It, it just, it, I can't imagine calling him Antonio Cesaro again, I guess. 
I mean, for some talent, it fits. Yeah, you know, like you say, the Elias, the Rusev, etc. But uh, I don't know. It feels like sometimes they're, they're just trying to force everyone into one category. You know, if, if you left his name as Andrade Cien Almas, he would. All right, it, it'd be harder for the casuals to pronounce, etc. But then again. You know, having a long name isn't necessarily bad because then it makes you stand out a bit more. You know, yeah. it's not just oh, forgettable Andrade on SmackDown. Like... It's like oh, it, it's that bloke with three, you know, three names. So I, I think it was fine as it was. It made him stand out. I, I don't see it, you know, having a huge effect on his career. No, but I, I, I just. You know, personal preference just just doesn't sit well with me. I think that they're still going to ride with it, not change it back. Which does it make them look silly to change it back? I don't think so. They could change it back, and everybody, oh, okay. (laughs) But I think a year from now, we'll probably just not even notice anymore. Really, if they just keep with it, you know, it'll be no big thing. And he'll still be having kick-ass matches, hopefully, like he did this week. Well, fingers crossed that they don't just use him for a few months until. You know, the worry that he'll sign for AEW goes away and then bury him again, but exactly. only time will tell, Travis. And this is WWE, let's be honest. <clears throat> they could absolutely do anything. When we come back, Matt, it is finally time. I'm so hyped. I've already been talking to your ear off for an hour off air about your journey, your trip to take over Blackpool, England. Here's the Bruiserweight and still UK champ, the man Pete Dunn. Right here, Slam Pig Genius, Max. Stick around. getting late getting that smooth the Vicky voice going mad welcome back it i gotta get more hype though because takeover is come and gone you finally went everyone is on the channel the, the, the dedicated listeners and we know you all watched it loved it. it's good stuff unfortunately like you said at the beginning of your video so much footage was lost due to just technical issues and bull crap but officially the video came out officially yeah just bullshit just Ugh. I wish it was like Dr. Mario where you throw the pills down like the virus was there and we could have fixed it. But unfortunately, we got we got 30 minutes out of it. Yeah, we got some good stuff in. Um, a lot of it was me complaining. But then if we'd have got the other two hours of footage, it would have been two hours of me complaining. Because like I said to you before we came on air, like the journey there was just like one massive mental breakdown. So maybe it's best <laughs> we did lose that footage. I think the biggest thing, that probably the majority of the people who watched it or have just seen footage of when it was in, you know, the, the show last week, a lot of people in their heads, you know, you always hear Blackpool for the first time, at least for most of us in the U.S., William Regal's hometown, right? That's the first time I ever really mm-hmm. heard Blackpool. Totally different. I, I'm pictured industrial and just in warehouses and smoke and just <laughs> concrete. I don't picture like kind of like a... I don't know, a nice ocean city or Myrtle Beach or something, boardwalk and yeah. that stuff. I, I wouldn't just quite describe it as as a nice <laughs> like beach, a seaside city. I mean, in the summer, it is very pleasant. Um, the warehouse thing you talked about, is, is there is that. It's like way back, you know, on, on the outer, re- outer reaches. But the Golden Mile and the Pleasure Beach, etc., it, it's pleasant. <laughs> just not in January, Travis. The wind was a killer. The weather was freezing. It was oh, the rain just soaked you right through. I had to bear, buy a new pair of, of trainers because I got a fucking split in mine walking down to the Pleasure Beach. And it was like I didn't anticipate my hotel being as far down as it was. I thought it would be you know just past the arcades. No, it was right at the fucking bottom. Uh, and for people who don't know the Pleasure Beach, it's this big amusement park with roller coasters and fucking other rides on it. And of course, all that's shut in January, so 
I didn't even get to well, you know, go there. It, but... Yes, we know what everyone's thinking when you hear Pleasure Beach. And no, it's not what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah. There's not a lot of nice hot Asian girls ready to give you relief, unfortunately. Not that you could have filmed for the channel, at least, but that's another story. Yeah. Blackpool, England, though, definitely took me by surprise what it has to offer. So it did. Is it touristy feeling or is it just seedy? Um, in January, it's quite seedy, you know, with all the, the, the horrible weather and the damp. But in summer, it, it's touristy. It's just that in January, there's not a lot open, you know, so it's, it's, you're limited to what you can do. Top of your head, I mean, town- your official count, how many vagrants? You were telling me a little bit off air. Do you think you saw in total in your little voyage? I'd say first night, I'd say a good 20 first night. Mm. Uh, second night, coming back on the tram. It's like when, when you walk it, oh, oh, 20, I'd say up the seafront itself. Um, town, coming back from the Empress Ballroom. I couldn't tell you. Just there everywhere. It's littered. God. They're like, they're, they're like fucking. You know, potato chip packets, they're everywhere, just floating <laughs> around the street. That's a lot. I mean, I'll go to, like, downtown Baltimore or something, right? I'll see maybe, like, seven or eight, but 20? <laughs> yeah. Christ. But yeah, Honestly, I get it. It's like, it's like they've got um, uh, the, as you, you see on the video, it the seafront is split into two. It's like there's the seafront, the road's in the middle, and then all the guest houses and the hotels and bed and breakfast, et cetera, are down the, uh, like, the back side of it. They've got um, these big bins placed, like, strategically feet apart. And I shit you not, Travis, there was one by every bin, just Mm -hmm. camped out in their sleeping bags by every fucking bin. It was, like, regular as clockwork. Did you throw potted plants out your window on them? (laughs) No, I was at the back. That's another thing. And I'm going to bitch about the hotel. Never go there. (laughs) Here we go. Buckle up. If you're in black. If you're in Blackpool, it was advertised to me as sea views. Um, my view was what I can only describe as a scrapper yard out the back. There was no garden to it. There was no sea view. There was some planks of wood lent against a wall in a courtyard. There were bin bags split open in the back where it just looked like they just took a load of old shit and thrown it out the back door. <laughs> <laughs> Hideous. Could not. It's the, Kidius doesn't describe it. Are we still talking about Mike Canellis asking for his... Oh, sorry, wait, go ahead. <laughs> Below the belt. <laughs> well, that's what we do. Slam pigs, Matt. Slam pigs, go ahead. Indeed. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's disappointing. That's always one of the worst things about travel anywhere. Is it, and hotels are so notorious for that crap just lying to you. It, pictures on like yeah. the website or whatever you're definitely a victim on here with the with the creaking floorboards and stuff you're telling me off here it was it was horrible if i'd have read the reviews beforehand i'd have booked somewhere nicer and what what was more annoying travis <clears throat> is that um we've got a, a, a chain of hotels here called travel lodge and it's not posh you know this it's not it's not five stars but it's where i always stay usually when i you know, go on my travels, and it's comfy, it's really warm, there's a nice shower, it, it was a little more expensive, but it's like, you know, just after Christmas, so money wasn't flowing, you know what I mean, so I thought I, I would do something cheaper this time, the travel lodge was eight minutes down the road, I could have walked it, and I was tempted the second night, I, I, I was going to stay the first night, and I thought, if first, the first night's bad in this shithole, then I'll I'll go to the travel lodge for the second night. I'll pay the extra money. But I never did, because it was like, I, I spent hardly any time in the hotel anyway. You know, I was either out and about or at the wrestling and didn't get back until late. So I thought spending out more money on another hotel would be just a waste. So I was valiant. I put up with it. Little tip of the hat, sir. But that would th- this isn't a, a travel guide podcast. No, we're actually gonna talk about takeover, believe it or not. What was the venue like upon arrival and just the atmosphere, the people like, and just before any of the show kicked off, what was just the general experience like? Well, I went um early on Saturday morning because I didn't know where it was. The woman at the hotel had told me <clears throat> so it was tucked down the back of the 
uh, the Tower Ballroom, which I thought was the fucking same thing originally. It wasn't. So I went to scout it out. Um, I walked up to it, and they had plastic sheeting all over the fucking front of it. It was that a lot of it was under what I can only describe as reconstruction. Um, the doors they were it looked fine from the doors. I saw the production trucks up the side of the Empress Ballroom. I posted the picture on Twitter for that. Um, yeah, it, it looked fine from the outside. It didn't look as glamorous as I thought it would, but what does in person? Right. And the rings, too, always. I don't care what wrestling event you go, whether it's a seedy backyard establishment or WrestleMania, the ring always looks smaller in person. Oh, yeah, yeah. I expected something massive. Uh, when we walked in, it's like they kept waiting forever. They said the doors opened at five. They didn't. We were still queuing at, at 20 past. But, you know, that's. I suppose they wanted to get everything done they scanned the tickets we went through this fucking big reception and there was this one woman just this one old woman for six thousand people just directing you know through there down there up there i thought because i, I didn't know the the seating in the empress ballroom i'd only ever seen it on the the first ever you know tournament to crown the first ever uk champion so i naturally thought the balcony was tiered like tiered seating so i thought i'd be up there sort of in the middle unable to see anything the balconies like have very very few rows of seats so the main seating is on the floor so i was down there and i walked in and i shit you not it was like walking into like a an old club in england i walked in there was a bar all the way down the fucking left hand side and it, it stretched the whole room this bar and then there were plinths and then you, you sort of walk through and there was all the seating. And it, it wasn't even professional seating. It was like these raggedy old red chairs they put out for everyone. I was happy with my view, but it was like it was like sitting in a in a club, you know, waiting and for I, your father. I, I vividly <laughs> remember like last time we recorded at like telling you like, man, you might have, you know, it's WWE takeover. They might have custom chairs like they do, like you could take with you. No, yeah. it's just like, here you go. Fucking lawn chairs. Yeah. <laughs> It's just like whatever they could pull out the back. But it's not about the chairs. It's not. It Honestly, I mean, yeah, it's a big part of it. It's not about the people. It's about the wrestling and the wrestlers. And yeah. I would say just from watching it at home, you definitely got your money's worth. What a show for you to attend. A historic show on a couple, couple mm -hmm. fronts. We'll get to all that. Um, dark match-wise, I know that's coming up soon. We don't want to give away too many spoilers, but there were some dark matches, right, Matt? Oh, yeah. Okay. The dark matches... I learned were in fact shown as this week's NXT UK like weekly show. Um, so we had Ligero versus Saxon Huxley, <coughs> Ginny versus Isla Dawn. That was fascinating. I'm sure you can imagine. And Marcel Bartel and Fabian Eichner versus Mark Andrews and Flash Morgan Webster, which was a really good tag team match just sitting there. So I can just imagine how it looked on on television this Mar week. Real quick, Marcel Barthel, because we meant to talk about him last time. Uh, he's going to be a big deal, in my opinion. Yes. Some big things. Yes, he is. Great um, look. Like, great fucking talent. On on television, Matt, um, I, I, I figured this trans... It's, for some reason, the UK tournament looked better than this did. Was it me? Yes. No, it wasn't. The UK tournament seemed to look glossier. And brighter for some reason. This, this had a, sort of a darker, grungy uh, look about it. But I, I think it suited the, you know, the overall takeover feel. Yeah, I, I don't think it deterred from it. It just, you, it's just crazy that these two shows came from the same venue because it didn't look that way at all on television. Um, yeah. This show, I mean, one thing about you guys, <clears throat> uh, you were consistent throughout. You guys were into pretty much everything. You were good crowd i feel like you guys would have been fun to perform in front of if i was one of those guys yeah I, I don't recall the whole because i mean the show started like properly at i think it was six o'clock like Ligero and saxon huxley came on at six and then we went right through to seven with the dark matches <clears throat> so I don't, I don't think for the whole and it didn't finish till well we didn't at least get out until just gone 10 
because Triple H came out at the end and we, you know, we listened to the announcer, Sankus, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I don't think we, four hours, and I don't think the crowd were completely silent once. There was always like a chant going or, yeah, or sure. something happening. It, it was absolutely amazing. I, I didn't envision it being like that, you know, for the whole for a whole four hours. But what a fucking atmosphere to be part of! And the most was, notorious chant, the, the most notorious chant come out of it. Are you <laughs> watching Vince McMahon? How how did that come about? What was that like? What, what was your everyone's reaction around you when that chant? You understood what they were saying. We we just went with it. It was like, I don't know where it started. I think it was um, a, a section of fans and underneath the hard camera that started it. It certainly seemed to sound like it came over from that way. But it was just like, during the Pete Dunne, John, uh, Joe Coffey match, it was just like, yeah, let, let's just do it. He might be watching, who knows? <laughs> and, and this, this may be, I'm pulling your leg on this, but it's amazing to me that such amazing musicians like the Beatles came from over there, the UK and stuff, because <laughs> you guys don't know time for shit in your songs. You're, I, I can't, it's hard for me to fathom keeping up. Look, it's like, are you watching? Vincent, man, are you watching? Are you watching? Are, are, it's all over the place. I'm like, they're crazy. You guys' yeah. chants are ridiculous. I don't know how you guys keep up with yourselves half the time. It's tremendous to watch, especially as American fans, because we, it's, it's just a whole different kind of culture, and it shows. It's great. And that's why I love okay. the, just the fact that the option of NXT, NXT UK exists, Matt, in general, is to see how, you know what I mean? Yeah, the, the difference in uh, in cultures and it's like how, you yeah. know what I mean, you cheer for them over there, but over here, it's just like a good night out. It's just like we're having a fucking good night out. We paid the money. We're going to sing whatever we want, even if, you know, management don't like it. Fuck it. It's like it's like a bunch of wrestlers set up in a pub. Because considering that you're standing what three inches of of beer the whole show, you're standing off it. Yeah, yeah, about about two to three inches <laughs> of beer by the end. It was just all over the floor. We were swim, <laughs> not fucking swimming in it. It was ridiculous. Oh my! <clears throat> it was wonderful. I can't begin to describe to you, Travis how wonderful it was. Literally, one probably one of the best nights of my life ever. It was fantastic. Well, this best night of your life ever officially kicked off with a great tag team match. Uh, finals of the UK Tag Team Tournament. Mustache Mountain, Grizzled Young Veterans. Uh, what tremendous heel heat uh, for Gibson. Yeah. Uh, Gibson does have his fans, though. They're growing more and more. I see. I notice each episode and week on the UK. But um, I uh, this match was great. What can I say? Solid tag team match. We've seen better from both. from Well, not both teams. From Mustache Mountain. But this was probably the best showing as a team we've seen on this show from you know obviously gibson and drake yeah. what did you think live what, what was the what was the crowd vibe like for this match the crowd were all over zach gibson it's like i mean he could have had his fans but you we didn't hear them there was two um two gentlemen from liverpool sat next to me one looked just like tyler Bate. honestly it's like if he wasn't in the ring i could have sworn i was sat next to him and that they were just they were giving zach gibson shit Call him a fake scouser, like tell him to fuck off back home. Wonderful stuff. There was a bloke, uh, might have been two rows into the front, had a, a sign with uh, Liverpool's number two and Zach Gibson's head going into a toilet. It was yeah. just, it was brilliant. You know, everyone taking their shoes off. Stand up if you hate Gibson, sit down if you hate Gibson. It was just, it was like a party atmosphere. Wonderful. I'm sure you didn't take your shoes off at risk of stepping in beer with your bare feet. I didn't. I, I was I was going to, but then I saw what was I was standing in. And I thought probably best not. I don't blame you <laughs> because one of my biggest pet peeves is like wet socks. I can't stand that. I would have ugh, that would have ruined the whole night for me. I just paid for fucking new shoes, Travis. Literally like an hour and a half before, I wasn't going to take my shoe off <laughs> and put, put put my wet foot in a brand new shoe. I thought fuck that. Yeah, fuck that. It's not worth it. Fuck that. <laughs> What do you think of the decision, though? I, I, I like the decision. I thought it was probably, especially with putting it on Tony Storm, and then you got Pete Dunne as champ, too. I mean, it's they just won the actual NXT tab titles last year. I think it's the right call. you got to build Gibson and Drake. Yeah, and the money's in Mustache Mountain chasing the titles. There's no fun in yeah. them having them, you know, straight from the off. Where's the story in that there? And plus, like, 
grizzled young veterans. They're a great team. I, I'm I'm starting to soften on James Drake now. I didn't like him a few weeks ago. He didn't really show me anything. But in this match, he was fucking awesome. But I, I'd say, like, one of the stars of the match, even above yeah. Zach Gibson. This is also yeah, the most he, I've been impressed since I've seen Drake. I, I haven't seen a lot of him in progress, but... Yeah. And the 450 splash he did from the top rope, lovely. Yeah. It was just... Everything, nowhere on, too. In, every, everything in this match was just crisp. It was hit perfectly, like... <clears throat> just everything. Mustache Mountain. The, the uh, Trent Seven Army chants and Big Strong Boy chants, they were just deafening. Yeah. Per any Mustache Mountain match, uh, this was no different. Then after the match, after the victory, Drake and Gibson, we saw uh, Triple H and uh, Johnny Saint, correct? Oh, Sid Scala come out. Sid Scala, <laughs> yeah, and Johnny Saint. Yep. And that was that, and that pretty much, you can't argue the point that it, that, was, that was a good call, it was the right call. I think everyone's pretty much in agree. I haven't seen anyone bitch about the decision, really. Nope. Uh, match of the night, right decision. Perfect way to start off the inaugural UK takeover. So, well, can't praise him enough. It only I grew. Hope... Oh, good, man. I was just going to say, I do hope Mustache Mountain get their hands on the titles at some point, but I envisage uh, a very, very long run. For Drake and Gibson. Yeah, me too. I feel like they're going to chase for a while. Probably by the summer, Mustache Mountain probably get those belts. That's a well, lot. I'm, I'm sort of thinking, and we'll get into this later with, you know, what happened at the end of the show, but I'm thinking, like, uh, we're going to get a sort of ring camp stable in NXT UK, so it would make sense for yeah. Mustache Mountain to have the titles by, at least by, you know, October time. Well, we know the uh, the Wal- the Walter debut later on, which we'll get to, was very shocking. That wasn't the only one. Holy goddamn shit. Finn Balor out of nowhere after a video package of Travis Banks was shown entering the arena earlier in the day, confrontation with Jordan Devlin. That led us to Travis Banks' entrance, right? Attack yeah. from behind uh, uh, Jordan Devlin. Yep, yeah. yeah. and then Jordan Devlin supposedly injured the knee. Uh, we would learn that Travis Banks did have a knee injury coming into TakeOver, which I didn't know about. But it couldn't have been that bad, Travis, because, just skipping forward slightly, the tapings the next night, he was active, and he fought Jordan Devlin in a proper match. So I, I think this was more just to get Finn Balor like, on the card and get some, some traction with a, you know what I mean, a worldwide name. Well, it was it was a head turning booking decision. It was it was yeah. honestly it was brilliant to do. Got more eyes on it, it was, and it worked. It was. I I just wish this has had a, a tiny bit more build for it. You know, the the initial shock of Finn Balor coming out was wonderful. <clears throat> you know, it was it was everything I could have hoped for if I'd have known at least. We, everyone thought it was going to be Walter. You know, there, there were massive Walter chants around my section. Um, but when, obviously when Finn Balor's music hit, it was just like, holy fuck. You know, better than Walter. It's one of those rare uh, rare crowd pops we get nowadays that do translate insanely well on television. It did. Um, yeah, what can you say? And this match was very good. Borderline, may I say, the other match of the night, in my opinion. I will say this, Matt. You know, it's the first time. Write it. Mark it down. I'm going to criticize Jordan Devlin. I'm a huge Jordan oh, Devlin. Uh, yeah, you ready? <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, a huge so, Jordan Devlin fan, but next to Finn Balor, ooh, I, uh, he looked, yeah. I, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, didn't have that same X-Factor look next to Finn Balor. I feel like he needs to no. season more. He looked every inch the student, didn't he? It's like really Finn did. Balor looked the star, and he just looked like the rookie who was there to get him over. Massive, just, tons of potential, not quite there yet for me. On that no. level, on that level. No. I mean, a victory over Finn Balor would have done him the world of good, but why would you do it yet? It's like there's legs in that. If Finn Balor doesn't leave the Rumble as champion, there's legs in uh, in bringing him back for a program with Jordan Devlin. Exactly. We, I, I feel like we'll see that match again someday. Obviously, from what we saw this week on a... Raw, Finn Balor's on to bigger and better things. Uh, what a week it's been for Finn Balor, Matt. Um, 
This match, I yeah. feel like it was Chris. This is the best I've seen Finn Balor look. And can Finn Balor, honestly, not even as the demon, the way he worked in this match captivated me. Credit to both men. Jordan Devlin pulling out mm -hmm. some great moves, too. Some great chain wrestling. Psychology. Great selling from both men. And this, this match was great. Um, it was. It didn't yeah. just feel like a one-off. It felt like Jordan Devlin will be back one day. The student will overcome. That's what I took away from it. Yeah, he will. He'll overcome Balor one day, and that will push him into the main event scene. I, I think until then he'll continue working his way up the ladder. But I, I think, I think ironically, like Finn Balor is is Jordan Devlin's glass ceiling. You know, the thing he has to break through before he can really drop into the main event picture full time. And there's going to be people that dis disagree with us and talk about Jordan oh, Devlin. Yeah. Honestly, he is booked differently over there uh, on the indie scene. He's booked like a more of a <laughs> serious killer type heel, uh, Matt. That's why he yeah. has the Grim Reaper logo. Because if you think of his character in NXT UK, that logo kind of makes no fucking sense. He's not a killer type yeah. character in UK. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But it's a cool logo. That is very true. And it was yeah. nice to see the, the NXT Finn Balor back. Not this fucking just miserable bloke on Raw who's been hampered by terrible booking and Baron Corbin, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, what, what do you rate this match? What did you think of it, man? I would rate this match as solid. If we're doing out of 10, I'd, I'd give it 8.5 out of 10. I wish it had gone just a tiny bit longer. I, I, I felt Jordan Devlin could have probably done with another three or four minutes worth of offense you know before he was put down but brilliant match it was great to see Finn Balor and crowd were all over it I don't know whether it came over on television I have watched it back and it, it doesn't seem like you know the crowd chance of you're a shit Finn Balor and poor a poor Finn Balor came over as well as they did in the audience but you know, the, the, Jordan Devlin's going on to greater things. Finn Balor will be back, I'm sure, for another run with Jordan Devlin at some point. And I very, very much look forward to that from what came out of this. Indeed. Um, that took us next, I believe, to Eddie Dennis and Dave Mastiff, correct? Yes, yes. <laughs> and I, I said um, a while back, this was the match I was least looking forward to because of the build-up. But again... Another good match, Travis. I wouldn't call it the best match. Out of all the matches of the night, it'll probably rank last on the list of ones I enjoyed. But I'd rank it the hardest I, hitting I, match of the night. Yeah. And Eddie Dennis very much impressed me with his strength. It's like, mm -hmm. I fucking couldn't lift that bloke up. The last stop <laughs> driver on Mastiff was incredible. <laughs> yes, it was. And the um, sidewalk slam on the... The steel steps. The uh, people were saying the finish was looked like shit and was about it. Was, eh, it, it works. It, it, maybe if they they tweak it and for like a vignette in the future, just the camera angle it look better. I yeah. he did go a little low on the finish, but it's fine. It doesn't ruin the match, guys. For Christ's sakes. No, and uh, to be honest, I preferred this finish more than I preferred the finish of the women's match. Like th this finish yeah. didn't just just you know come out of nowhere. Like we've been saying about NXT UK for fucking weeks and weeks about the finishes just being flat and meaning nothing. You know, I, I felt this built, built to a very nice finish. And I'm not sure Eddie Dennis came out of it looking like the star they wanted him to. But Dave Mastiff certainly did. Oh, yeah. I love that whole camera effect now when he stomps his leg like a dinosaur. Yeah. It's like the fucking natural disasters. Never seen? Effect. Never seen? It's unbelievable all the years they've had characters like Earthquake and stuff like that. They've never done that effect, really, until now. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, but I'm yeah. glad it's back, because it, it works for him. Another match both of us would recommend you guys check out. Thumbs up on both sides, safe to say for me, for this. Yeah. Delivered. Delivered. You know what? This is the first time, man, I'm ever going to say the Tony Storm match. is probably my least favorite match on a, of a card. But it's true. I mean, I expected better from this. I re I, I I expected like a twenty five. I don't. I didn't time it. How like it might have gone twenty five minutes, but I expected a twenty five to thirty minute classic. And I don't know. I I felt it was rushed. Once the match was over, 
it felt like you, you sort of knew why it felt rushed. You know, it's like she'd been through so much shit with the pictures and and the inj- back injury, et cetera, et cetera, that they wanted to make her look a million dollars. And by having to win the title, I suppose they did. But I thought they could have dragged it out a bit more. You know, it, it, it to see her come out on stage, like the way she walked out, so confident. And then, you know, she, she was, you could visibly see she was almost in, in tears just before Rhea Ripley came out with the fan support. And it, it was like, th- there's absolutely no way she's losing this match. You know, I, I could yeah. have told you before Rhea Ripley came out, there was no way that Tony Storm was leaving without the title. And it sort of, it just then sort of brought it down a bit for me because I wanted the intrigue. Pan- pandering in a way <laughs> comes off to Tony Storm. Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I, I would have been perfectly happy with some Tony Storm momentum. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going again. It's like I'm back there all over again, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have been happy with some Tony Storm momentum, but like a complete rear Ripley domination, just forcing Tony Storm to overcome even more odds to make the eventual victory seem seem like she fought for it. Because to be honest, it felt like she'd been given it rather than yeah completely fought for it. That that night, at least, and and the finish kind of, yeah, it took two uh, storm zeros or pearl river plunges or whatever they want to call it this week. It took two of those to beat Ripley, but same time that kind of contradicts the character of Rhea Ripley, what they've been building her as. It should have taken more than that. And the finish did come out of nowhere. I totally agree, and I got to say, from the fan cam, you all, your video fan cam uh, that you sent me, the reaction I saw in there, or the live, the probably the flattest reaction to a finish all night, I would say. Yeah, I mean, the result got a good reaction, but the finish, it was just like, is that it? Mm-hmm. So is, is that all they're going to give us? I mean, <clears throat> you know, th- this should have topped, for what they've built Rhea Ripley up to be, and, you know, Tony Storm's the challenger, and the matches Rhea Ripley's had in the past weeks with Diana Perrazzo, which was fucking, good. for me, it was ten times better than this match with it Tony was, Storm. It was, I agree, totally. I, I, I don't know. I, I just felt like it was a... It, honestly, I, I've seen so many podcasts since then say, oh, it was the right decision. It was the right decision to put the title on Storm. Too soon to take it off, Ripley. That's what I thought. That's exactly my thought. It was like... But no. We know why they did it, but... Tony Storm I, got I, her, quote, title and credibility when she won that tournament. What does she need the belt for right now? Exactly. Exactly. And I don't see what this did for Ripley at all. You know, it made her look... Com- What's she been champion for, telly-wise? A couple Five months. Five weeks, maybe? Well, telly-wise, a couple months. That's... Yeah. I'm going... Yeah. See, they're so confusing with their fucking tapings. And exactly, she's, exactly. She defended exactly. it at fucking Evolution, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> she won it, I think, in April, I think it was. Uh, in April. In August. Yeah. Um, In real life. Telly, November. Beginning of December-ish. So, she's not really been champion for that long. It was, I, I know it was like the beginning of December. I don't even think it was November. <clears throat> yeah, it it was during the some of the last episodes were recorded. Shots I remember of, the thumbnail. Shots of uh, Kaylee Ray shown in the crowd with a couple others. Uh, Luke Menzies. Not a great and reaction for Menzies yeah. at all. It was kind of like Menzies even had that look on camera. I don't know if you caught it on television. It's kind of like, well, that's it. That they're not going to pop. Yeah. I think um, a lot of people looked at who? who? Who the fuck is this? Yeah. I I do like uh, the idea of a Kaylee Ray Tony Storm feud in the future though. Yes. And Jazzy Gabbert, I think she could bring something to the women's yeah. division. Let him force her for um Jenny. Yeah, just don't put the don't put her in the fucking Tamina role though. It's like she's she's better than that. Oh yeah. Um I mean she's built like Tamina, but she's a better wrestler. And of course Charlotte Flair got a pop. But, yeah, uh, Jazzy Gabbard has uh, jumps off a screen. She's she's a head turning yeah. gimmick kind of. It works. Yeah, I, I think build her up to be like the unstoppable heel, and her and Tony Storm. That that's a that's a feud you're going to pay to see in the future. Speaking of paying to see, what you really paid to see, not Takeover, <laughs> not Jazzy Gabbard. It was the Bruiser Wade Pete. The first time, Matt, you've ever 
seen a Pete Dunn match live defending against Joe Coffey with Gallus. Uh, mm-hmm. My God, uh, we, we saw the reactions. We saw the passion, man. You were <laughs> you were on the edge of your seat. You were worried. I, I vividly remember you like biting your your gritting your teeth. You were literally. I th- were you worried for a little bit he's going to lose? I was. I, I was convinced that if they were going to take the title from him, this would be it. It's like history making first night. You know, why not make it a bit more history making by ending the the reign? But honestly, it was one of it was one of the matches where I was just I couldn't rest until the end. Yeah. Because I I was like, it, it, a Gallus going to come down and interfere and cost him the title? It's like, is he going to tap? Is he going to be pinned? And it, it was like. Looking back, knowing that Walter was to come, of course he wasn't going to lose the title. But in that moment, it's like with, with the crowd reaction and everyone chanting his name around you, it's like, holy fuck, they could actually do it. But I'm glad they didn't. And seeing him in person was just amazing. I look back on the videos I made and I think maybe I went a little bit over the top, but fuck it. It's like, I paid to see him. Of course I did. Exactly. I sat. Three, I sat for nearly four hours waiting for him to come out, and it was like, do you know what? It's a night out. I'm gonna let me what little hair I've got left down, and absolutely loved it. It's like earlier tonight off air, we we're talking about how we, you know, it t- it's one of the worst things for me attending any wrestling event is to be in that dead section. Those you're just surrounded yeah. by people that aren't reacting or on their phones the whole time. They're like parents that are there because their kids are there, but they won't let their kids like be an idiot and cheer. Like they like sit down. Yeah. What are you doing? You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Get your money's worth, people. That's they—they they want you to do that, and it God, God forbid, it's fun to do that. You know what I mean? It is, it is. especially when everyone else is doing it as well. It's like you feel like such a fucking moron just sitting there, where everyone else is standing up and cheering. It's like everyone else is doing it. Get involved. We need a shirt now on the merch store, Rocky. I know you're listening. Eventually, of Matt pumping his fist, going, "Come on, Pete!" Because my God. You were into it. The guy beside you, too. The, Come on, Peter. That guy was great. Um, yeah. <laughs> truly wish I was there with you, my friend. But the match, it was... I know Meltzer shit all over it. Fuck Meltzer. We're not... Whatever. That's one guy. People shouldn't, you know. Yeah. What do you think, your honest opinion on this match? Um, look, uh, I've watched it twice. Obviously, I have. Um, once uh, once on the network, it, it, it looked two completely different matches, I'll be honest. Being there in person, it was just, it wasn't so much about the match. It was just about, I didn't want it to end, but I wasn't sad when it did because I couldn't take it anymore. It was like, it was like, um, do you remember when, I, <laughs> when the second annual tournament was on and I said oh, yeah. how I was pacing up and down when he fought yeah. Gibson? It was mm-hmm. that, but it was ten times worse. It was like I so enjoyed watching him perform, and he's he's ten times better in person than you could ever think he was on television. I know it's a weird thing to say, but he is. He just gives off that aura. You can definitely see that aura and feel it in your cam footage too. Just it, it feels yeah. like the whole vibe and atmosphere changes when his music hits. His lights are a little different than everyone else's. He just brings that vibe, and it's like. He's kind of like a, I, it's so lame to say, but he comes off to you guys the way you react to him, like a national hero over there. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's like, he's, it's the best way to put it. I, I would say he's the present day version of Bret Hart, like the 92, 93 Bret Hart, mm-hmm. where he was just adored everywhere. Yeah, even though most of you guys over there are what, like, fuck Birmingham, he gets a pass, I guess. Yeah, Birmingham. yeah. Birmingham's a shit old, but Pete's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, this match was all right, in my opinion. Not, they don't. I thought it was fine. Meltzer just nitpicks. It was, it wasn't the best work of either man, but it was considering what we'd seen all night. Hey, I'm, I was fine with it. A uh, little couple botchy type thing, but the finish seemed like a botch at first. But I like how, if it was how they cut, a finish was fine. I like the. Uh, the fingers tap there. Uh, you went not for you were bummed that you th- did. You think it was a botch at first live. Um, I I thought it was just the end, and then it just carried on. So I thought, well, it's probably just kicked out. But seeing it back on TV, I think it looks like a botch. I think it does, I, and I think if it was, if it wasn't intended, then 
they recovered from it very, very well, as they did the the fall from the top rope to the outside, yeah. which could not have been planned. It was like it looked so fucking bad. But why would you plan that? Yeah, I, I think they worked themselves to exhaustion, and when they got up there, it was just I can't keep my foot in, <laughs> and they just went fuck it and fell. But even though that was a obviously botch, I I thought it added to the the tension very well. It was just like it'll go down as one of the most memorable moments of the match, if anything. So there you go. They can't go anymore, and it looked for me, it looked really good. You know, it's a, this title means so much that these two men have worked themselves to exhaustion just to to claim it. Yeah, it, realism at its finest. Um, and then yeah. after you could be at ease. All was right in the world. And then the music hit Symphony Number no. 9. Walter is in mm-hmm. NXT UK. The rumors were true. Um, and you know what? We nailed it. This is exactly what we predicted they'd probably do when he, they brought him in. Lo and yeah. behold, the stare off. By the way, when Joe Coffey got on the apron, that boot was fucking amazing. But did yes. it hurt Joe Coffey as a character is the question. <laughs> They're kind of making yeah, him look like a little good. brother type. Like, get the fuck out of here. The adults are talking. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think they've built Joe Coffey somewhat well over the past few weeks. Um, apart from his promos, which was just the same thing every fucking week. But And now it's just like, the, I, I, I like the way they moved Pete Dunn on from Gallus. It's like, yeah, you finish with that feud now. This is where you're going. Yeah. But at the same time, I think you could have just let Joe Coffey walk away up the ramp. You know, yeah, I, I, think, I don't think, I think he it made really him look second to Walter. But I, I see, I see with their mindset of you know it makes Walter look like such a badass. But for one, it, if he's going heel route, it's fine because Joe Coffey already had a long match. It kind of makes Walter look cowardly to do it after the guy had a war. But either way, they did yeah. it. The stare off, uh, the standoff. We know these guys have worked in other promotions around the world before. Nothing new if you've seen that. But for you know, this was great. This was a perfect cherry on the Sunday for a. Two thumbs up across the boards for me for this TakeOver show. I grade this show, Matt, before you give your final synopsis, your experience, all that. I grade this a solid A. Solid A. Yep. Uh, must see. Must see. It's, probably, it's going to go down as one of the shows of the year. What a month, a fucking month of January has already been for wrestling across the board, Matt. I said across Brady. the board twice in two minutes. I need to, I need to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> Get a dictionary, everyone. Um with yeah, with with takeovers and the rumble still to come, it's going to be a very good month for wrestling. The rest of the year is going to struggle to hold up to it, I think. But I would give, I'm going to give this an A double plus just because of the experience. It's like it was a it was a one off experience. It was the first ever, so amazing night. Loved the main event. Dave Meltzer can log on to uh, you know fuckoff.com where my middle thing will be waiting for him. <laughs> It, I loved it. There's I tons of malware it. on that site, hopefully, too. It can infect his computer <laughs> so he can't write another fucking review. Review, yeah. If that, honestly, if this had been in the Tokyo Dome, it would have been the seven stars. If it was in the Egg Dome with Ricky Fukuoka. Yeah, fucking Mark. Um, yeah, A double plus. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And I'm going again. As soon as they announce the next takeover... I'm going to try and get front row tickets if they're not sold out because it, it, it's one of them things, Travis, that people go, it's just another wrestling show. But it wasn't. It was more than that. And I want to be part of that experience and a part of that atmosphere as much as possible. Amen. My friend, I am glad. Your journey to the very first NXT UK takeover is in the books. I'm so delighted you had such a good time. Like I said, I wish I was there with you. Thank you, my friend, for taking the time on your trip to contribute footage to the channel. I truly appreciate it. One more time. Where can everyone catch you? You can catch me on Twitter at The Perfect Tenant. You can buy my book, The Undertaker, A Trip Down Death Valley, from CompletelyNovel.com, Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, and from our online store, UnionSmack.BigCartel.com, where you can also purchase our official shirts. No one coming in the next month-ish, let's say. And Happy New Year, Matt. First show of 2019. Yeah, Happy New Year. (laughs) 
It's only January fucking 18th now, but Happy New Year. Yeah, as always, follow me on Twitter at the Hibiki TMD. Hit that subscribe right down below for all the best in retro gaming. That's it. That's all we got. Slam Pigs Union Smacks in the books. Until next time, we'll see you then. Cheerio. Thank <laughs> you.